Welcome to Mathematical Image Processing exercise number six. And today's exercise is about the discrete Fourier transform. You have seen already the continuous version of it and uh, you have seen its use in signal processing or image processing in the lecture. And we today want to focus on the computational part of it. So, of course, um, you may have heard already in, in a different course about something called the FFT, the fast Fourier transform, which is a, um, uh, it's a, it's an implementation of the discrete Fourier transform. So this one is just an algorithm. And this here is a, is a yeah, mathematical concept that, um, we want to dive in today because um, we are going to uh, use this knowledge in order to, first of all, understand how to interpret the output that we get when we use the Fourier transform or the fast Fourier transform in Octave or MATLAB. And in, um, I think next week, we will also use this knowledge in order to design a simple low pass filter. So let me start with an example that we want to understand, I hope, today. So if I have a one-dimensional signal f, and this signal is just 1, 0, minus 1, and 0, then, of course, I can just type in FFT of f and fire up the FFT implementation of Octave or MATLAB, and in return, I get the following vector. So. What we want to understand now is how to interpret uh, the, um, the FFT output of Octave or MATLAB. And um, to make it more mathematical, so let us start um, with, I think, the stuff that you also find on the exercise sheet. So today we will be focusing on, on exercise 5.5, but not going through the uh, exercises in particular, but I'm, I'm going to do a little bit more of, a, of an introduction and crash course, which will already solve some of the exercises that are there, but maybe in a different order and with a different focus. So we start out with a, a signal, a one-dimensional signal, which we call F and is an element of the complex numbers to the n. So it's just a vector of complex numbers. So f is c of n, and this is our discrete signal. And um, we also want to assume that um, we continue f periodically outside of this set of indices 1 to n, uh, which is something that you already know from um, last week's convolution exercises. And now, this is just a definition. We want to define the Fourier transform of f. This should once again be an n-dimensional complex vector. So f is a complex vector. So we can think about f as something like this, f1 components until the nth component. And so I'm just going to copy the definition from the exercise sheet and tell you a little bit about the components. So the discrete Fourier transform of f, so I denote the discreteness of it with the, this n below here, is once again, as I said, a vector, an n-dimensional vector. So we want to know what its jth component is for j a number from 1 to n again. And we define it as a sum going from uh, k equals 1 to n. And then we use the components of our original signal f, and we multiply it with the term e to the minus i omega j minus 1 times k minus 1. So this minus 1 this discrepancy that you may see also uh, when you compare it with the continuous version is once again due to the fact that we want our index set to start from one, yeah, which is um, just nearer to the actual implementation in, in um, 
MATLAB or Octave. Okay, so what is this angular frequency omega j minus 1? So this is also defined here. So I just copy the sum going from 1 to n, fk e to the minus i 2 pi over n j minus 1 k minus 1. So this angular frequency omega j minus 1 is this part here. So this is a definition, but it's it's um, so it will be also our goal to understand how properties that we know from the continuous Fourier transform can also be found in this discrete version. So let us first start by recalling the definition of the continuous Fourier transform. So I'm just shorten it up and call the continuous version CFT as opposed to DFT. So in the, in the continuous version, we no longer have a vector f, but we have an L1 function yeah, that takes real values to complex ones. And how is this defined? So it is defined as a function again on R. So we plug in a frequency omega, and it should be 1 over 2 pi to the 1 half. And then we have an integral over the real numbers from our function f of x e to the minus i omega x dx. So we can also uh, we can already spot some of the similarities. So first of all, going from the discrete or to the continuous setting can be seen as in the discrete setting, we have a sum that somehow sums about all the indices that are available in my space. And in the continuous version, I have an integral that goes over the real number, in, uh, the real numbers instead of a discrete index set. So related to this fact that my, my um, base set is R and not C to the N anymore, I also have a change in the variables. So in here, I go over x, which is a continuous variable. It runs through all the real numbers. And in the discrete setting, I go over all indices k. And I find them here and as a k minus 1 also up here. And this continuity is also reflected in the angular frequencies that I'm considering. Here, I just have an angular frequency omega, which once again is an element of the real numbers. While here, I have a correspondence to indices because I also only consider discrete frequencies. So the idea now is, as for the continuous Fourier transform, that we want to write a periodic signal, f. So why is f periodic? Because we continue it periodically. Write this periodic signal as a linear combination of periodic functions. So let me write this down. So the idea is, write f as a, a linear combination of periodic functions. And the periodic functions that we want to use are, well, they can already be seen here, but let us first look as the, at, um, at the counterpart of the discrete Fourier transform, which is the inverse of it, because then it com becomes more clearer. So for capital F in C to the N, once again, an n-dimensional vector, 
I define the inverse Fourier transform, which is once again a vector. Therefore, I consider the jth component, and j once again runs from 1 to n. As given also, I think on the exercise sheet, 1 over n, sum from k equals 1 to n f of k e to the i omega k minus 1 j minus 1. So, and something that one can show is that this definition gives us a real inverse operation to the discrete Fourier transform that we, that we have seen here. What does this mean? So if, if F actually is the Fourier transform, uh, sorry, if capital F actually is the Fourier transform of a signal F as above, then we actually get out our original signal F here. And we also, so at position J, and we also see the linear combination here because the periodic functions that we want to use in order to write this as a linear combination, they can be already found here. So let us understand how these periodic functions work or how they are made up. So first recall um, the formula that the exponential of um, i omega x is nothing else than the cosine of omega x plus i of the sine of omega x. So we have in here the real part of e to the omega x and here we have the imaginary part of it. So those are, of course, periodic functions. And these periodic functions are constructed by using angular frequencies omega. And the angular frequency is defined as, as uh, follows. So omega is 2 pi over t. So this is our angular frequency. And t is the period length. So for a periodic function, t is the length of time that needs to pass until the function repeats itself. So and going from the um, period length to the inverse period length, gives us the so-called frequency. So our we want to write fj as a linear combination of functions of this type, exponentials i to the omega x, yeah, because, well, this is, this is what we already see from this formula here. Yeah, we want to take a linear combination, therefore, so let me maybe also underline this here, a linear combination, that means we need a sum and we need linear factors. And then we also need some kind of a basis, which will be made up of periodic functions. Let us take an even closer look at a single periodic function that we have in here in order to see how all these terms work together. So let me just sketch a coordinate system. So, and if I go, let us start very simple. So we go from zero to two pi, and we take a function, the cosine of x. Yeah, then this function will look something like this. So it starts at one, it's at minus one for pi, and it goes back to two pi, if x runs from zero to pi. So if I now, renormalize this interval and I want this function to go from 0 to 1, I do the following. I rewrite this function as 2 pi cosine of 2 pi 
times x. Yeah? And so now if I plug in 0, I'm at 0. The cosine of 0 is 1. If I plug in 1 half, I'm at cosine of pi, which is minus 1. And if I plug in 1, I'm co at cosine of 2 pi, which is 1 again. Let's do another step and go from 2 pi to 2 pi over t. Now we have a period length t, and this is reflected as follows in this plot. I just multiply this with t. So at point in time t, I'm at once again 2 pi times t over t, which is 2 pi. And this is how it works for one of these functions. So this angular frequency already contains all the information that I need in order to get the picture of how this function should look like. Same goes for the sine function. So now in the discrete setting, we do not have a continuous angular frequency, but we have a subset of angular frequencies, which somehow corresponds to sampling these functions at discrete points in time. So let me maybe copy this one here for further use on the left-hand side and take a look at discrete angular frequency, which is defined as 2 pi j um, over n, oh, 2 pi j minus 1 over n for j going from 1 n. So uh, I think it's better if I maybe delete this one because then we can also have a look at the definitions above. So this is our discrete angular frequency and then we from this discrete angular frequency we can also pass to a discrete period in some sense which is just in our case n over j minus 1. Yeah, okay, if, if j equals uh, one, uh, 1, then we have a problem here, but um, so let's say j is greater than 1. So what I want you to see from this expression is that higher j, so if j gets bigger, as it's in the denominator, and not the numerator, we get a shorter period. And a shorter period means a higher frequency. So this is one important intuition that you need to have for this j. Now, if j gets bigger, the frequency gets bigger. And a bigger frequency means, well, uh, that in this plot, our function will oscillate faster. So let us let us take a, now an example at these discrete frequencies. So let's start with j equals to one. Now this is was the problem here with this um, discrete period here. In this case, just going to look at the cosine as I did here, I have the cosine of two pi. Let us also set n to 4, 2 pi over 4 times, and now j minus 1. So in this case, our function is 1. Yeah, because it's just cosine of 0 yeah, for all j that go from 1 uh, to n. Also going to plot this one here, but the plot will get interesting in a minute. So I have a one here, minus one here. It's basically the same plot as before. Now I have my K, uh, my J here. One, two, three, and four. So I don't not going to need the four here. So but so this black function here is one here, it's one here, one here, and one here. It's just it's just constant. 
And I'm also going to continue it periodically because this is just something that we agreed upon when we, when we do discrete Fourier transforms. So let's make it more interesting. Let's take a look at the at j equals two. In this case, we are looking at the cosine of two pi over four times one, yeah, which is, um, ah, so I'm forgetting something here. Um, I also need, uh, yeah, so this one here, should be k. All right. So let me clean up this mess. So, so here we are at uh, times zero times k minus one, and here again times k minus one. Yeah, because I still need a function that depends on k. So in this case, we have the cosine. Um, of pi over 2 times k minus 1. And this function looks as follows. If k equals um, if k equals 1 no, I, still, I, will, I will have to shift this. Sorry. Uh, the, the plot will not work uh, if I do it differently. So if I start at k equals zero, then I'm one again. If k equals one, then I'm at zero. If k equals two, I'm down here. And if k equals n minus three, which is three, I'm up here. So as another example, let us look at j equals two, three. So in this case, I get the cosine of two pi four times two times k again, which is now giving me the cosine of pi times k. So how does this one look like? It's once again, one at zero, it's minus one at one, it's one at two, and it's minus one at four. So let me maybe with a dashed line also show you how this cosine should look like in this in this red case, also in the blue case. And you can see, so now the higher j corresponds to a higher frequency as well. So for the last example, let us look at j equals to four. So in this case, I get the cosine of three pi over two times k. But when I plug in the values from zero to three for k, I will see that it coincides with the blue formula. Yeah? So if k equals two, I'm just cosine of three, three pi and cosine of three pi is minus one again. Um, yeah. Oh no, I just saw that I did a mistake here as well. Um, because it, oh no. So, okay, I'm going to clean this one up. So, so we were at the green one. So if I'm at the cosine of six, pi over two, I'm at, um, no, okay, of nine pi over two, I'm at zero again, okay. So this is for j, okay, equals two, three. So the same goes for the blue one, and it will be one again if k equals four. Yeah, but I'm not considering this part here. So let's see if the red curve, if I can fix the red curve as well, if I plug in the three here, the cosine of three pi, 
it should be minus one again. So I go down here and at four, I'm at four pi, which is one. So I go up again here. So what is the problem now? I have a higher frequency for the cosine, but in my plot, I cannot distinguish the blue curve from the blue curve if I only look at this discrete points in time. And this is something that we call aliasing. So the higher frequency is not recognized by us just looking at these discrete points in time. So I want to make another observation here for you, which tells us it's that cosine of three pi over two times K is the same as considering the cosine of minus pi half over K. So this one has the same frequency as the blue one, yeah, which is also what we what we just observe here. They coincide at the same points in time. And this will be a better interpretation of what the coefficients of frequencies do for us in the discrete Fourier transform. But the details on this interpretation uh, will follow next week. So we, now we did a lot of a uh, lot of plotting here. Um, let us come back to the idea of writing uh, a periodic signal as a linear combination of periodic functions. So we have now taken a look at what we are dealing with, periodic functions that are, have been discretized. And so what we now can do is, so writing something as a linear combination is something that we know from linear algebra. Let me just copy the idea once again. So of course, if I start out with a complex signal of length n, I can always write it with respect to the canonic, canonical basis that consists only of vectors that have one at one position and are zero elsewhere. What I now want to use is uh, another basis that is already visible from our above formula. I'm going to copy this one as well. So in fact, we have here already our Fourier basis that we are going to use for this manner. So we want to write our function f as a linear combination of our Fourier basis vectors. How do these vectors look like? So let us do once again an example for n equals 4. And I have also prepared a little table where we can look at these examples. So let us, let us take a look at this table. So what we are looking at is for k equals 1 and 2. Yeah? So we have more k's, they go to 4. But only for the first two basis vectors, I first give you the angular frequency, which is 0, yeah? so the constant function, or pi halves, which was the red function, in the, uh, which was the blue function in the above plot. Now, if I look at bk and I want this vector here that I made blue here, this should be bk, so the kth basis vector and its j's entry. So if I set omega k minus one to zero, I get this vector here with ones, only ones. This corresponds to the blue uh, to the black plot that we had here. So it's only ones. One here, one here, and one here. And the way to think about it is, well, as we see here, this is just a vector that I get when I take the cosine of zero times j minus one from j going from one to four. So if I now take a look at the next uh, angular frequency, what I get is now, well, you can just uh, try this also at home for plugging in different values here. So if omega k minus one is pi halves, I get once again zero at j equals one. And I get also e to the i 
pi over 2 for j equals to 2 and so on. And if you plug in the formulas uh, that we saw, so e to the i and an angle, you get that this is just a cosine of something plus i times the sine of something. So are these good vectors for our basis? So what you can check is, well, they, they have one nice property, which means uh, orthogonality. So those BKs are orthogonal vectors. Yeah, and in general, BK will look as follows. BK will be exponential of i times omega k minus 1. So this is where the k comes in. Times j minus 1. This is where the component comes in. Because j goes from 1 to 4. So this is our general vector. So what I can do now is, when I have an orthog orthogonal basis, do a normalization, which, um, well, all of the entries have norm 1, so I just need to normalize, in this case, for general n with the square root of n, and those are orthonormal. And now we can do something that works in every space that has an inner product. So given an f in our complex vector space, I can always write f as a linear combination with some factors alpha k and my ortho orthonormal basis vectors bk. And how does this work? Well, we use the scalar product that we have on this space. So k goes from 1 to n. And I use the scalar product of f with the kth um, basis vector to give, to give me um, my uh, kth linear factor. And I multiply with the vector again. So this is my linear combination. So what happens if I plug in the definitions now? So let us start maybe first with the with this. Um, so I copy down the sum that will remain. And now let us write down this inner product first. So this inner product gives me 1 over square root of n. And then the sum of j going from 1 to n of fj times bk of j. Yeah, but we have, we already know how this looks like. I'm going to copy it in a minute. So bk of j can also be written as the exponential of i times um, k minus 1, j minus 1. And note that this is a complex vector space, so I need to take the complex conjugation here, which gives me a minus in there. So I hope you can still read this part. So I'm going to enlarge on it a little bit. All right. So, but now, so I'm now nearing the problem, but from, from the opposite, uh, opposite uh, direction. What we can see here in this part that I'm going to mark blue is that this is just a case Fourier coefficient. Yeah, so I have found a way to, to express my original signal f via the Fourier coefficients, which are the numbers that I get from applying or from starting up the fast Fourier transform, hopefully. So what I get here is um, I just take the, the sum over the kth Fourier coefficient, so I forgot the tilde here, times 1 over square root of n times bk tilde, but bk tilde was nothing else than 1 over square root n times bn, so I'm just going to write 1 over n times bk. 
So, and now I have a very nice basis. It's not as announced in the in the exercise that we just solved an orthogonal uh, orthogonal basis, but it's uh, an orthonormal basis, but it's an orthogonal basis. So those vectors do not have length one anymore, but they are orthogonal. So there are different ways to define the discrete Fourier transform, and some will g actually give you a, a orthonormal basis, but in this case we only get an orthogonal one, which is not not our problem here. So um, these are our basis vectors. Yeah, so these are our periodic functions that have also a normalization factor in front. And we have here our linear factors. That, uh, well, they tell us how much of each basis vector we need in order to build up our original signal F again from the periodic functions that we started with. So, how does do we actually work with the discrete Fourier transform? So there are actually two steps in signal analysis, as uh, always. So the first step will be uh, given a periodic signal f, yeah, uh, find uh, the Fourier coefficients, yeah. via our discrete Fourier transform. Yeah, this is, gives us all the frequency information that we need. And the second part, which is where we will continue next week, is the interpretation of these coefficients. So I'm sure you have heard about this frequency information and that the linear factor tells you which are the dominant frequencies and which are the frequencies in our signal that can be ignored or are not so important. And this is the interpretation step that we will see uh, next week in more detail. What we are going to do now is um, take a look at our initial example and see that this formula here, so f equals the sum of uh, the Fourier coefficient times the basis vector, actually works. So let me open up this again. So we have a, uh, our, our Fourier transform of f, which is 0, 2, 0, 2. So this is in order to read this, we now, now know, OK, I take 0 times the base, the first uh, basis vector, 2 times the second one, 0 times the third basis vector, and 4 times the fourth basis vector. So let me just um, save this as capital F. So and now, um, so I already know I do not I do not need the first basis vector with, because I, here is a zero. So I only take the second basis vector, and this one is defined as exponential times i times pi over two times k minus one. So and k will be a variable that goes from one to four. So the B2 will be 1, 0, minus 1, and 0 in the real part, and 0, plus 1, 0, minus 1 in the imaginary part. So how about B4? Also define this one, because we also need it two times. So B4 um, will be 3 pi over 2 times k minus 1. And it also looks interesting. We take a look here. We see, as we already knew from our original plot here, so I'm plotting the green one and the blue one. Look at this one. So they have the same real part. It's 1, 0, minus 1, and 0. But they have um, imaginary parts that, when added together, add up to 0. So here I have plus one i, I have here have a minus one i. And here as well, minus one i plus one i. Okay, so this is a good thing because when I take the sum and I have my original signal f, which is real valued, also the result will be real valued. 
So let us take a now a look at this formula. So in this case, I take um, 1 over 4, which is the 1 over n factor. The length of f is 4. So, and then I take f of 2, yeah, which is the second. So maybe let me output f as well. So I take f over 2, f of 2, which is the second linear factor here. And I also take d2. Uh, maybe let me write it the way it's also written in my notes. So 1 over 4 times b2. So, and now I do the same for the fourth as well. So f of 4 times 1 over 4 times the fourth basis vector. And I get out my original signal f, yeah, which was 1, 0, minus 1, and 0. So these imaginary units all ha have the prefactor 0. So I have reproduced this formula here, and now I uh, hopefully um, helped you a little bit to understand how these numbers that are outputted here can be interpreted as linear factors with respect to a uh, orthogonal basis that is generated from periodic functions. Uh, so we have a little bit time left. So let me scroll back to this uh, to this plot, to this confusing plot where I had somehow an index shift in there. So if you recall from linear algebra, basis vectors always need to be unique. So if we take a look at the blue and the um, green function here, they do not seem to be unique at all because they coincide at the same uh, points in time. So as vectors of the space c to the 4, they are identical here. But what this plot ignores is the fact that these vectors also have imaginary parts. Yeah, we are in a complex vector space, so each component of the vector has a complex, uh, has a real part and an imaginary part. And for two vectors to be equal, not only their real parts need to coincide, which we have here, but also their imaginary parts need to coincide. And this is where the difference is. So the difference can be seen in the in the real and in the imaginary part. So let us take maybe um, a look at the imaginary part here. So I already highlighted that those ones are the ones that are different. Yeah, and this can also be seen in the plot. Yeah, so we have two uh, sinus functions there, but they are just uh, they have the opposite sign, and therefore both vectors are different. But in the sum, um, the imaginary uh, part cancels out, and I get the result that I just started with, with which is the um, which is the signal f. All right, so that's it from my part for today.